want to start by thanking you all for, for being here. Uh, I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to preach and for lending me your undivided attention. I feel very privileged to be preaching during Black History Month. Um, I also feel very fortunate to have put together a liturgy that I thought was really cool. Uh, <laughs> I hope that you felt the same way. I know I packed a lot in there, there's a lot of different voices saying uh, different things. Uh, I hope that something in there caught your attention. At the end of the liturgy, we all voiced the words of Asada Shakur, and it ended with, uh, we have nothing to lose but our chains. And that's the title for the message that I have for you today. We have nothing to lose but our chains. I hope that I can take that message and relate it to uh, our biblical text in a way that enlivens it, that challenges you, uh, that forces, not forces, it's not like forces, that um, <laughs> compels you to want to open up the way that you think and to grow spiritually. So our verse comes from the book of Joshua, and indeed it comes from the mouth of Joshua. This is uh, Joshua, one of two people who actually make it into, make it from enslavement all the way into the promised land. So Moses didn't make it that far. Moses was in the wilderness and God said, you shall not pass. <laughs> Moses had to say, the other side of Jordan. Uh, but Joshua is special. Joshua and Caleb were the only two people uh, who were enslaved, uh, go through the wilderness with uh, the Lord, and make it into uh, the quote-unquote promised land. Um, the other is Israelites who were enslaved all die in the wilderness. Their kids make it, but uh, they don't make it. So we're talking about Joshua here. Uh, Yehoshua in Hebrew, Deal like that. Uh, if the name rings a bell, it's because this is the same name for your beloved, uh, our beloved uh, New Testament Jesus. Your <laughs> Hebrew Bible is better for Jesus. So Joshua is the savior for the Israelites. His name, like Jesus, means uh, he will save. Savior for the Israelites. He leads them into battle. He gives them, or he he helps them with a physical and a um, a literal salvation from death and destruction. This Joshua we have here has all these things attached to his name. He's the one who started from the bottom, from enslavement, and made it all the way into Egypt. He's the one who God saw fit to keep him alive when God stopped Moses and and let the other people die. Uh, he's the one that led all the people to victory in battle, and that's the one who speaks these words. So Joshua says, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, choose for yourself this day who you will serve. When you think about all that Joshua represents, his words sound like a challenge. In my sanctified imagination, I can picture Joshua embodying that tough, uh, tough guy persona that you see in those hyper masculine warriors and epic movies. This is the, the Jason Momoa type. <laughs> and uh, I see Joshua stepping forward. It says Joshua's uh, addressing the Israelites, but I see him stepping forward, picking somebody out, talking way too close to their face. Uh, you know, people do that when they're trying to intimidate you. And uh, Joshua is right there saying, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, it's a challenge. Choose for yourself this day who you're going to serve. What are you supposed to say? <laughs> Everything that Joshua represents pushes us to comply. Imagine, I imagine the Israelite would feel compelled to say, of course I choose the Lord. Any other choice would defy God's authority. And we already saw what happened when people defy God's authority. Uh, when Moses, not Moses, when Miriam spoke out of turn, 
Or when the sons of Korah tried to say, hey, uh, Moses, didn't God talk to other people? God does an earthquake and they all fall and, and Miriam gets a disease on her arm and it's not pretty. So when Joshua, who apparently God favored a little more than Moses, says, choose for yourself who you're going to serve, ah, it's very scary to not comply. But, we're Christians. We're not ancient Israelites, so Joshua can't intimidate us. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, we read the Bible with a slant. We read the Bible as the story of Hashem, the story of the Lord, the God of Israel. And just like the Israelites who are in the story, those of us who are Christians feel the story, uh, read the story with a feeling that we need to choose. Lord as our God. Anything else would be blasphemy to our Christian faith. Of course. Or so we think. But I ask you, as readers, as listeners, have you forgotten the very words that you have a choice? So many forces push against you to tacitly comply. Um, nevertheless, the words are right in front of you. Choose for yourself. Yeah. Before you so quickly jump to the conclusion, I choose Jesus. The Lord is my God. Think about the fact that you have a choice. Choose for yourself this day who you will serve. You have a choice in what you believe. You have a choice in the God that you serve. You have a choice. It may sound frightening to leave the security of believing that there is no other choice. It's easier to believe that we serve the Lord because who else could we serve? But truly, any security that you can gain from willful ignorance is no security at all. I offer you the chance for us to really think about the freedom of the choice that's before you because we have nothing to lose but our chance. When black people were first brought to this country, we were brought here in chains. We had our freedom stripped from us. As we read in the liturgy, uh, Malcolm X described it as more than our freedom, our, our labor, our lives, our culture, our identities, all these things were taken from us, and we were placed in a situation of an extreme power imbalance between oppressors and oppressed. We were given the impression that we have no choice in the matter. But from the very beginning, don't get this twist, I'm not doing the Kanye West, slavery was a choice. From the beginning, there were heroes who even in the worst scenario were able to find the power to make choices because they knew we had nothing to lose but our chain. I'm going to come back to these heroes in a second. This is Black History Month 2019, so it's a good, as, yeah, woo -woo. So it's as good a time as any to talk about history. When were black people first brought to this country? The common narrative that you're told, that we're told, is uh, the beginning of uh, black history in the United States is 1619, 400 years ago. So this would be a time to commemorate uh, a milestone. We're told that we were brought here the first African slaves were brought to the Jamestown colony in what is now Virginia uh, in 1619 as, uh, well, we're told as slaves, I'd say as enslaved people. So there we go. When children are learning their history in school, and we all identify with our past in different ways, uh, a little black girl is told that her past in this country is one of slavery. Asad Shakur heard that story uh, when she was young, before she changed her name, she was uh, Joanne. When she was young, she heard the story of the first Africans enslaved at Jamestown in her history classes while she was growing up in New York uh, in the 50s. She writes about how much shame she felt when she heard this history. Uh, in her autobiography, she writes, I, I had grown up believing slaves hadn't fought back. I remember how ashamed I felt when we learned about slavery in school. 
In the meta narrative of history that young Asado was fed, black people simply existed as slaves prior, for uh, 200 years prior to the Civil War. But when she grew older and wiser, she decided to look for herself at her people's history, at our people's history. She realized that she could not free her mind if she simply accepted the narrative that was fed to her. There must be more to the story. She realized she could not free her mind if she simply accepted the narrative that was fed to her. And so she learned to search history for her own heroes. What other option did she have? Should she just passively believe that her identity is encapsulated in that word slave? It's easier to simply accept what you've been told. But she decided to take the risk of looking into matters for herself. Because after all, we have nothing to lose but our chains. And so she searched history, and what she found was astonishing. Yes, there was slavery, but that's only half the story. She learned about fighters from for liberation the entire time. She learned about people like Nat Turner, who struck fear into the hearts of powerful oppressors, a so-called, Nat Turner, a so-called slave who led a rebellion killing more than 60 representatives of evil, a man at the bottom of a hierarchy of oppression who left people at the top of the hierarchy trembling in fear. And she took pride in that. She took pride in being able to say, yes, we fought back against those that would steal our humanity. She learned about Denmark Vesey's foiled plans for liberation, about the Stonewall Rebellion, about Gabriel's Revolt, about the people on the Amistad. She learned about rebellion in New York in the 1700s, in a time when black and white people fought together against a common oppressor, uh, uh, elite, wealthy white people whose, who, in whose benefit it was to keep oppressed separate and against each other. She learned about John Brown, a white man who wasn't afraid to confront evil with violence. A man who killed supporters of slavery in his armed resistance against the, the uh, perpetration and the spreading of an evil system of slavery. She learned that her people have a long history of being brave warriors for justice, for humanity, for liberation, for uh, a different vision of the best of humanity. And she also learned that there were, at times, white allies who joined in this fight against injustice. She also learned about people whose words were weapons, those for whom the pen was mightier than the sword. She learned about people like Sojourner Truth, a 19th century hero who spoke out against racism, slavery, and sexism. Someone who was aware of the multiplied oppression that uh, Asada Shakur would feel 100 years later oppression not only from uh, people outside of her group, her racial group, but oppression from co-liberation fighters who also were sexist. She learned about the passionate rhetoric of David Walker who crystallized the contradiction of a Christianity that, or, and of a nation that uh, celebrates liberty and yet denies it to so many of her citizens. She learned about Jordan Lee and Frederick Douglass and Maria Stewart and Henry Hyde Garnett and Harriet Tubman, the list could go on and on. All of these people lived during that time when she was told that her history was one of her people just being slaves. And all of these people were left out of the story that was handed to her. No one told her about the people that fought back. She was told a half-truth, and as, as is often the case, half a truth tends to be a great lie. In fact, the lies are great. Black people have labored to illustrate to the world that our history includes uh, stories of African cultures, nations, empires, technology, religion, etc., all going back before our history begins with slavery. Mansa Musa, the most wealthy person in the history of the world, was a West African from Mali. Africa is the home of civilizations from Great Zimbabwe in the south to ancient Egypt in the north, from Kush in the east to Timbuktu in the west. The known civilization was smelting iron a thousand years before any northern European had tried that. 
Adventist Homes, the oldest continually operating university in the world, one that was founded by a Muslim woman, Fatima al Jari, 1,200 years ago. And the list could go on. Telling the story as if enslavement was the beginning of our history is a half truth and a great lie. Right. Telling the story as if enslavement was accepted as normal by the people who were enslaved is a half truth and a great lie. But even starting the story with Jamestown is a half truth right. and a great lie. Did you know that black people were brought here for enslavement before 1619? In the summer of 1525, That's right. That's Spanish right. boats landed in what is today the Carolinas and became the first people, other than uh, Native Americans, to arrive uh, for settlement in the United States, in what has become the United States. Among the more than 500 people that came on these boats were Africans who were brought there for enslavement. But not long after their arrival, so they come in the summer of 1525, and not long after their arrival, uh, things are going awry. The, the uh, climate, uh, the winter, the, the, um, the new conditions that the people are facing, uh, aren't helping with their attempts to settle, and it definitely doesn't help that the people who they brought to enslave aren't happy with their situation. The Africans who were brought there to be complicit, to be subservient, to build and to work and to submit were not being submissive. And by November of that year, they had revolted, they were burning down houses, and they had uh, forced the uh, oppressors into a state of panic. By January of 1526, the non-enslaved people left. <laughs> they got on boats and they went to Hispaniola, which is today uh, the Dominican Republic and uh, Haiti. And so the people that were left here were the Africans who were brought here for enslavement. The people who had fought back for their freedom. And those people were taken in by the uh, Homeland Security, the Native Americans. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they were embraced in these communities. And so the first non-Native American settlers to uh, permanently reside in, the United States, in what would become the United States were Africans. When we're told that the story of black history in the United States starts with uh, slavery at Jamestown, they skip over not just a, a, a random other event, but an event that paints the picture completely different. They skip over a, an image of black people who from the very beginning said, oh no, we're not just gonna accept this. They, paint, they skip over a picture of, uh, of successful slave revolt. They skip over a picture of Native Americans who are able to embrace uh, foreigners in a fight against a common foe. Asano was able to search history and find truth, and that truth freed her mind of its chains. She was able to do this because she applied a critical eye to the things that were before her. And I want us to follow this lead as we return to our biblical text. Joshua says, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, choose for you, for you today whom you will serve. And he goes on, whether it's the gods of your ancestors, God or gods of your ancestors on the other side of the river, or the God or gods of the Amorites among whom you're living today. That's right. But it's for me and my household we will serve the Lord. Well, hold up, Joshua. I'm asking you to think about it. Because I do have a choice. Yeah. And I'll not let somebody else define my religion for me. Yeah. If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, we feel so much pressure to choose what Joshua, or the biblical author, presumes to be the right choice, that we overlook why serving the Lord might seem undesirable. Come on. Come on, Sam. 
When my ancestors were given that choice by their white enslavers, it was obvious why serving the Lord would be undesirable. Yes. Who wants to submit to a God that says slavery is normal? To a God that says slaves submit to your masters as if to the Lord. Ex that's a New Testament. Yeah. <laughs> Who wants to submit to, to, to a, a, a God whose people are saying, you're supposed to act like a beast of burden? Yes, serving the Lord seemed undesirable to them. And if we look at our text with any level of compassion for humanity, we should be able to see why serving the Lord could seem undesirable. Of course, you could look back before the book of Joshua at, at texts that, uh, that imply serving the Lord means the unequal treatment of women. We could look at texts that where there's the death penalty prescribed for a man who has sex with another man. We can see that and definitely say, well, that makes serving the Lord seem undesirable to me. But you don't have to go that far. If you stay right there in the book of Joshua, you can see divinely sanctioned attempted genocide. Yes. You can see God commanding them to wipe out the inhabitants because that's supposed to be the solution to all their problems. So, yes, if serving the Lord means violence against Native people and a theology of manifest destiny, Come on. then serving the Lord does seem undesirable to me. Yeah. It might sound scary to say that, but remember, we have nothing to lose but our chains. So Joshua says, choose for yourself this day who you will serve. Option one, the gods of your ancestors. Option two, the gods of the people among whom you're living today. My great, 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 great something, grandparents were given this choice. After being brought to this country in shackles, they were faced with the question of whether they would hold on to their religious traditions and beliefs from Africa uh, while living in this country, in this context, or should they choose the white man's religion? After all, the white man's religion was one of power. I have other people in my lineage who are black hawk Indians. They were given a choice between this Lord, who um, represents the power of conquest and all that, or their native religious beliefs. It's easy to act like there's no choice in the God we serve, but indeed, choices were made I know in my history, choices were made. But here's the big point, and uh, the side of relief for those of you who think this sermon is going toward the <laughs> Don't let the powers that be put constraints on your spiritual imagination. Amen. Amen. Don't let the powers that be put constraints on your spiritual imagination. Yes. My people were given those choices as a dichotomy. They created an abundant life in Christ because, or we created an abundant life in Christ because we did not accept the multiple choice that was given to us. Wow. On your tests and quizzes, you got to accept the multiple choice that's right there. But in terms of religious imagination, <laughs> you don't have to accept that. In the crucible of slavery, we saw something beautiful in Jesus and something ugly in his Christians. <laughs> So we embraced Jesus and redefined Christianity in a way where we were able to indict those who were not acting in the image of Christ. We saw something liberating in the God of Israel, and we also saw something hypocritical in uh, her so-called followers in this country. And so we clung to the God of liberation while combating the evils perpetuated by others in her name. And in all of this, we did not forsake our spiritual roots. We wove our religious traditions and beliefs into the fabric of our new spirituality and religious practice. Don't let someone put constraints on your spiritual imagination. Remember, we have nothing to lose but our chains. When you look at the biblical text, realize that the Bible itself is a contested ground. The things that you're learning in seminary show you the ways in which the development of your Bible includes people that not only have diverse ideas, distinct ideas, but even 
theologies and ideas that are in competition with one another. What's to stop you from picking certain theologies and rejecting others? From taking sides in the contest that created this text? What's to stop you from doing so on the basis of the Spirit of God moving within you? Some will tell you just categorically you can't do that. But don't let others put those constraints on your spiritual imagination. Remember, we have nothing to lose but our chains. By theologizing imaginatively, you think you lose security because you're drifting away from what you've already always known. But in truth, you're casting off the restraints of small minds. You're discarding the shackles placed upon you by those who would revel in seeing you support the current world order. When you ignore the fact that you have a choice, your silence is a vote. It's a vote for the perpetuation of the status quo. And if you look around you today, you can see that the status quo is full of systemic injustice. We're drawn to this passage, when we're drawn to this passage, we're drawn to think that we must agree with the narrator's perspective. We must say, Joshua, yes, I choose the Lord. Why? Out of fear of being left out? Because we assume that that must be the right answer? Who taught you to hate your history? To reject the gods of your ancestors? on the other side of the river. Who taught you that the values of the powerful are superior, more desirable than the values of those whom they oppress? Who taught you that you should ignore or create apologetics from biblical scenarios of violence and genocide? Who taught you to call God father but never mother? Yes. Who taught you that thinking outside the box will turn you away from the divine? Yes. Who taught you that in order for you to be right, every other religion must be wrong? Come on. Think about it. When Asada Shakura thought about her history with a critical perspective, she uncovered how many lies are hidden behind the half-truths that were placed in front of her. She saw that these half-truths were like blinders that were wrapped around her head. And so I challenge you to remove the blinders and apply the same critical eye to your faith. Yes. After all, we have nothing to lose but our chance. Amen. Amen.